going to give a short uh, video lecture today about family violence and abuse and the implications of the current COVID pandemic for these issues. So I'll go ahead and share some slides. Um, as I've been uh, revising my textbook, The Family, um, I was updating the material on family violence and abuse, intimate partner violence, sexual assault and rape. Um, and uh, that should be out in a uh, half a year or so. In the meantime, um, I wanted to give some thought to the questions uh, uh, that have been raised about the possible implications of the current crisis for these issues. And I thought it would be a good subject to put together into a video lecture for you. Um, you may have seen headlines like this. Uh, uh, the home isn't always a safe place for victims of domestic violence. Uh, a rise in domestic violence around the world associated with uh, the lockdowns. Um, we don't really have all the information yet to draw conclusions like that, but we do know enough from our general knowledge and our uh, what we know about the trends uh, so far to uh, raise some questions uh, and uh, start thinking through the issues. So that's what I'll be doing here. To put this in the, uh, its historical context a little, um, we really have a remarkable large uh, decline in violence in this country um, since the 1990s, and family violence in particular. This chart shows the violent victimization of uh, uh, people aged 12 to 17 by family members. This is from the uh, National Crime Victimization Survey. So it's from a survey I'm um, asking people uh, what violence they have experienced. And you can see this just very, very dramatic decline from about 14 um, incidents per hundred for per thousand population all the way down to uh, just over two. So a very big decline in family violence. So the backdrop to this is this very good news. Um, and that sets the stage for where for where we are today. Um, we can say some things about why this violence has declined. There's a there's a very broad literature on why a violent crime has declined in general in the United States and in uh, some other countries. Um, which I'm not going to get into entirely, but there are some specific issues related to family violence that may be uh, that that may be relevant. This is all slightly speculative, as it's hard to to specifically attribute uh, change in the level of violence to particular changes um, in social practices. Um, there has been a rise in uh, services for uh, people experiencing or at risk of experiencing family violence. Uh, the shelters and hotlines uh, that you may uh, be aware of. Um, uh, these uh, help people to gain some protection or distance from abusive partners in particular. Um, so that's been one factor. Another is the overall trend towards women's independence, their rising education and employment prospects, um, their, uh, the rising cultural acceptance of women's independence, uh, single parenthood, and so on has made it easier both sort of logistically uh, and structurally and also um, in terms of culture and values uh, to, for women to leave abusive relationships. Um, and then, frankly, the decline in marriage and, and cohabiting relationships, just the less time that people, especially women, spend in relationships actually reduces their exposure to one of the, um, uh, to the, to the main risk factor, which is being in the presence of a spouse or partner. Um, nevertheless, um, intimate partner violence uh, remains a serious problem. I'll talk about child abuse uh, neglect in a minute. Um, uh, when we look at sort of a lifetime measure, um, uh, have you ever experienced this? You can see um, uh, a little over a quarter of men and women have sort of ever experienced um, uh, violence in their relationships. As you go down the chart, you get to more serious um, uh, uh, violence, severe physical violence, contact sexual violence, that is sexual violence, that's not just a threat, and then stalking. And on those, you see a much bigger gender disparity. So um, women are much more likely to experience stalking and contact sexual violence, for example, than um, uh, the, the overall um, slap, push, shoved measure. So there's a very strong gender component to this. That's not surprising. Um, to define our, uh, the sphere that we're talking about when we say family violence and abuse, uh, we're putting it in a particular context, an institutional context, as I described uh, in the book. Um, the social context of the family um, uh, uh, defines um, the arena we're talking about. These are caring or intimate relationships, relationships with partners, uh, romantic or sexual partners, with children, with elders, people for whom there is a caring or intimate relationship. Um, within the family. Um, key issue uh, related to family violence and abuse is the secrecy and isolation that is, if not prevalent, at least made possible by 
um, uh, this, the way um, families are structured, um, the, literally within the walls of a home, but also more, more figuratively within this sphere of privacy that we construct around families um, that uh, uh, people value very highly, uh, when it's good and when it's bad, um, makes it very uh, makes family violence and abuse a very difficult nut to crack. Um, I always take the perspective, and I want to reinforce the perspective that when we talk about family violence and abuse, we're not talking about bad apples and uh, and uh, individuals with uh, with um, uh, with bad behavior only. We're talking about a systemic feature of family life. That is, um, that does not mean everybody experiences violence and abuse. What it means is um, it happens uh, at a high enough, uh, enough level of prevalence um, and, as, uh, and has continued to happen as society has changed that we can start to think of it as a structural feature of family life. Um, doesn't mean it can't be changed, of course, as you saw the big decline, but we, we want to think of what our institution and our, the structures of our society are doing to um, sort of enable or, or reproduce this violence over time. Okay, specifically on child abuse and neglect, um, uh, we have a definition uh, uh, where it's the act or failure to act on the part of a parent or caretaker that results in or puts children at risk for physical, emotional harm, sexual abuse, or exploitation. So it's an act or failure to act. That's what makes it abuse or neglect. Um, and then it's physical, emotional, sexual uh, abuse uh, or exploitation. Um, this chart just shows who the um, Perpetrator is in reported cases of sexual abuse and of, of child abuse and neglect, and um, it's overwhelmingly f parents, family members, mother, father, mother and father, um, uh, male relative, uh, and then down uh, the much less frequent categories below. Um, so the family is a very dangerous place for children. Um, obviously, uh, neglect sort of has to be done by families because that's who is responsible for children. So. But not only, only if you're responsible for it can you be guilty of not meeting your responsibility. Um, the high number for mothers here is um, uh, a feature, a, a function of the fact that many children live with their mothers only, not their fathers. So this is a family problem. Um, we have some particular risk factors that we want to consider when we're thinking about um, how the current crisis might be, um, might be affecting this problem. Um, in general, Parents with mental health problems of their own, um, such uh, including uh, behavior problems like impulse control or self-esteem, or any history of violence, including uh, the victims of violence, that those are risk factors for violence uh, in the family today. Um, households where there's violence between adults are often also dangerous places for children, but, uh, uh, violence that can also come to involve um, the children. Uh, poverty, poor families, and poor neighborhoods um, are associated with increased risk of uh, abuse and neglect. Um, it's partly just because neglect, uh, poverty itself may, be, uh, may bring neglect in the sense of not having the resources, um, but also um, whatever has brought people to be in poverty also makes their lives difficult in ways that may increase the risk of violence and abuse. Um, and that's also related to the problem of weak um, uh, family and support networks. Um, so uh, having people around and available and in touch um, with the resources themselves to respond to a crisis or a problem within families um, is very important, especially after something happens um, so, uh, so that people know and can take uh, steps to intervene. Um, there's been a lot of these stories. I'll show you one. Um, this is from um, a, a, a local TV station talking about uh, talking with advocates uh, uh, who are concerned about domestic violence um, and child abuse and how the current lockdown uh, may be increasing those risks. So we'll watch the clip. We need you to stay home. And Ohio is staying home to stay well, but for some, home is the one place that can do the most harm. We're very concerned. We know that this is a dangerous time for people to be home. The coronavirus has not slowed partner and child abuse. The problem weighing on the mind of Governor Mike DeWine, who addressed the concern Thursday. When the, the children stay home, they're not seen by someone outside the family. When you have children who, who are not being seen, you know, we, we certainly worry about that. The CEO of the Domestic Violence and Child Advocacy Center in Cleveland says the calls for help are steady. What we are seeing on those calls is that there's a greater degree of fear and anxiety. Uh, people are really scared right now and there is escalating abuse. Because of the coronavirus, many children are isolated at home with their abuser, away from other relatives, teachers, 
friends and help. We're seeing more violent types of situations, um, and that leaves us real concerned about the safety of the kids. Officials at Cuyahoga County Children and Family Services say they are still working during this virus crisis to protect the most vulnerable. About 60% of our calls in March were about physical abuse. And that's up about three to four percent overall. The coronavirus has only added stress while dwindling income and in some cases food. School staff might be reporting anything that they notice or they see that's going on with the child and that's not happening. As advocates and therapists see a surge in requests for support, one of the biggest ways the public can help is to watch over one another and report abuse. We all need to be checking in on each other right now and taking care of each other. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about um, how the COVID pandemic may be affecting issues of abuse and neglect. Um, you may hear a lot of the um, sort of uh, um, first world problems type discussion of, oh, we're stuck in our family, oh, we're watching the same TV shows, oh, we're, we're eating boring food, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, uh, you know, our pets are, you know, the, the daily life struggles of people whose lives are okay during, um, during this crisis. And of course, that's not gonna tell you the whole story, especially when um, things are going really wrong. Um, some key factors, economic stress and hardship is definitely a factor for abuse and neglect and family violence in general. Um, just in the last few weeks, uh, speaking as I am on April 6th, about 10 million people have um, filed new unemployment claims. That's an absolutely astounding number. There's a huge number of families that have had a very serious economic shock, lost their incomes. Um, the sheltering, of course, is isolating people from their support networks. Family and friends are also sheltering. Who's going to check in on families um, where there may be trouble, who's going to notice if something is going wrong, who's going to help if somebody needs help, a place to, someone to talk to, um, someone to literally escape to, and so on. So all of those resources as, they're, um, as people's movements are constrained to within their households, um, their access to uh, support and help obviously uh, can be diminished by that. So that's a serious issue. Various kinds of services may be unavailable, um, whether they're uh, social services formerly in the government or informal uh, or nonprofit, uh, uh, non-governmental organizations may just not have the resources to work during this period. Um, they may not have the staff, um, and so they might not be providing the services that people are used to that are sort of an outlet um, or a safety valve for families that are experiencing violence. Um, and then there's a whole network of people, especially with child abuse, um, where there are um, uh, people who are required by law to report and by ethics to report um, violence uh, or abuse if they're made aware of it. This includes teachers, uh, clergy in some states, healthcare providers. Um, so all of those interactions become a place when the outside world can kind of step into the family um, and, and intervene if there's violence or abuse going on. And with all of that interaction, interaction cut down, we're just not going to know about as much of uh, the violence and abuse that may be happening within families. So these are all theoretical, that is we don't have evidence that these things are all happening yet, but we have reason to be very concerned that they very well might be. I'll switch to intimate partner violence uh, away from children to adults. Um, as in the case of family violence with uh, children, we've seen a big decrease in intimate partner violence um, among adults. Uh, you, from something like 16 per thousand uh, women experiencing intimate partner violence uh, in the mid 90s down to about four. So about a three quarters reduction in intimate partner violence uh, as reported on this uh, survey, which is a good quality survey as well as we can do. Um, for men, actually the uh, intimate partner violence has also declined, but obviously much, much lower. So it's not as, not as much of a central concern for us. Uh, we can see some, um, uh, we can see some possible uh, COVID implications when we look at homicides. The previous chart was non-fatal violence because it's based on a survey. You can only fill it out if you're alive. Um, when we look at homicides, we see that women are most likely to be killed by their intimate partners. So in 2018, a little over a thousand women were killed by intimate partners. Um, only 360 men were, although a lot more men are murdered overall. Um, for women, it's much more concentrated uh, among intimate partners and for men it's much more likely to be associates or strangers that is uh, friends criminal partners and rivals and so on and also strangers so interestingly in the covid crisis we may actually see intimate partner uh, uh, we may see homicide falling more for men because they're just simply having less interaction with um uh, with each other 
um, and with the with, and the people who are doing the potential violence and homicide are just not don't have aren't interacting with as many victims. So that we could see a decline in homicide, but maybe not as much for women who are spending a lot of time with um, their spouses and partners. Um, there are patterns uh, to intimate partner violence and two broad categories that we uh, identify in the research. One is called situational couple violence, uh, sometimes have been called common couple violence. And this is violence that arises out of a specific dispute or conflict. There's not exactly a, a, a pattern of escalation over time. And it may be triggered by things like stress, by losing a job, by economic shocks and so on. So that's why we would be very concerned right now that um, we might be seeing more of this in families today, simply um, uh, more things to be um, uh, at, at, uh, in conflict about. On the other hand is the more serious violence in the sense of a pattern of escalation and often very harmful or even fatal consequences. Um, used to be called intimate terrorism, now often called coercive controlling violence. And this is a campaign uh, for control and domination, usually by men over women, although not exclusively, often an escalating pattern of violence. Now, the reason we're concerned about COVID with regard to this are um, the isolation uh, and uh, uh, maybe making it um, maybe conducive to this pattern of, of escalating control. Um, that is, the victims, usually the women of this kind of violence, um, usually need some kind of outside support or intervention to, um, to escape or, or mitigate this violence. And if they're isolated, they may not have that. Um, in, in addition, um, the threats related to going out is dangerous, um, uh, who makes decisions in terms of who can go out and when, and the, the, um, the negotiation of rules for mobility and so on, all that can kind of feed into the um, controlling violent impulses um, and behavior of, of, of the mostly men who are practicing this kind of violence. So this is where we'd be very concerned about an increase in the violence associated with COVID. Now, uh, only a, a little bit less than half of all intimate partner violence, going back to that same um, National Crime Victimization Survey, is ever reported to police. So most of it is not reported. And uh, the reasons that uh, women give for this, I, I analyzed here, um, fear of reprisal or getting the offender in trouble are the, is the most common reason. That is, either the uh, person doing the violence is going to punish me for reporting it, or the person doing the violence is going to be taken away um, from our family or um, uh, uh, will lose the economic support and so on. So the idea of bringing the police in is going to cause more harm um, than good. Dealt with it personally is about 20%. And then this lack of faith in the police, they won't come or I don't think they would help or they'd be biased against me um, is the third uh, reason that people give for why they don't report it. All of this, we don't know how this would play out um, uh, in the context of this uh, pandemic environment, but it seems possible that um, uh, it, could, it could lead to less reporting um, uh, uh, or not. It's just speculation, so we don't really know. Um, a few words about rape and sexual assault. Um, most sexual assault is uh, perpetrated by people that the victim knows, victims mostly women. Um, acquaintances, that includes people that, uh, that uh, people are on dates with. Uh, intimate partners, um, uh, that's uh, together about two thirds of the uh, rape and sexual assault. Um, stranger uh, uh, stranger uh, rape or sexual assault is not unheard of at all. It's about 24% of cases. Um, and so it raises the, um, the question of wh what would be happening now. Um, so most are perpetrated by um, acquaintances and intimate partners. Um, so on the downside now, uh, women are more isolated with their spouses and cohabiting partners, increased risk. On the other hand, less exposure to acquaintances and strangers. There's less mo moving around, um, less dating, and uh, just sort of less exposure to, um, to uh, potential perpetrators. So we don't know how this, uh, how this will go overall, but we have reasons to be concerned about the intimate partner aspect of this, as I discussed earlier. Um, I want to touch on a couple of interventions um, that we have reason to um, believe may be helpful, or at least are, uh, uh, lots of people think they're good, so they're trying them, um, which may uh, be factors in the, uh, as we try to deal with the current situation. Uh, one one uh, innovation has been this practice of rapid assessment by police. When they arrive at the scene, um, they have sort of a checklist um, and uh, it 
formalizes or routinizes the assessment of how serious is this violence, does it fit a pattern of escalation, and right at the scene when the police are called, should they separate these partners um, and track the uh, victim towards uh, victim support services or some kind uh, of some kind that may help with something like an escape plan and so on. So there's some promise to that. Um, when there's a recurring pattern, uh, people have used civil protection orders, um, sort of a court ordering people to stay away from the uh, victim of their violence or abuse, some success with that approach. Um, um, courts have in some cases mandated psychological treatment or intervention of various kinds. Um, the record on this is rather mixed, but um, uh, some positive results. Um, breaking uh, a family violence into its own category in the judicial system so that the judges um, uh, uh, working in that are sort of experts and, and, um, and focus, uh, sort of specialize, uh, bring their expertise uh, to that issue. Again, um, mixed results. And then I mentioned earlier, um, as a possible cause and decline, the sort of broad um, expanse of um, uh, domestic violence victim services of various kinds, including things like making an escape plan, um, uh, identifying when, uh, sort of how bad the problem is, um, uh, uh, support and counseling, and so on. Okay. Now, if we had this big decline in violence um, since the 1990s, over a quarter century or so, um, what does this imply about the future, and what is what we're going through now apply about the future? Imply about the future? Obviously, too early to say, um, but uh, we're we're trying to get on top of our situation here. So there's an argument, a general argument, that modernity, this period, sort of post-industrial. Uh, since industrialization to the present um, uh, uh, has brought an era of less interpersonal violence. Um, a few factors play into that. One is the whole construction of childhood as a, as a long period of innocence um, where children sort of deserve to have a life without pain and suffering um, um, as, a, as a stage of, of life which is recognized by parents and families and institutions and the government and so on. And so just sort of protecting children um, with this, um, this image of childhood as a period of innocence. Um, so that's sort of a modern innovation. Um, in addition, um, the general rise of state power, although states can, of course, do terrible things, um, the, um, the giving the state the power to control violence and resolve disputes may reduce interpersonal violence because instead of killing or, be or beating up the person you're having a conflict with, there's a process for, um, for uh, outsourcing that uh, intervention to uh, a formal authority. It raises a whole different set of questions of surveillance and oppression from states, but may reduce interpersonal violence. And then this, this argument has been made by Steven Pinker and others um, that um, the, the rise of rationality and reason as an ideal itself reduces interpersonal violence because you sort of need a reason to do things and um, you sort of reason yourself out of the violent resolution to things. So that's an ideal that maybe this, this whole era, this long-term era in terms of a couple of hundred years is um, been a decline in interpersonal violence and maybe that continues. For families, and this is especially relevant to the last quarter century in those figures that I showed, um, we know that um, having a history of violence in childhood um, is, a, is a serious predictor of violence in adulthood. So experiencing less violence in childhood, um, uh, uh, parents experiencing less violence may really translate, may have its own momentum and produce uh, subsequent generations uh, with less violence. So that could be great. Um, now, when we have things like, I would have, Two months ago, I would have said climate change um, or Trump, uh, but now we have this issue of, of the pandemic and it raises the question, does history really have a direction? Can we say, oh, we're moving in the direction from this past period with more violence, this future with less violence, um, uh, you know, how, how's that work? Um, it raises, it unsettles, any, any narrative that has to do with um, a direction of history is unsettled by big crises if they don't fit in that narrative. So um, we don't have an answer for this. We don't have an answer for a lot of what I've talked about today, but I hope that by giving the context and terms and some background statistics, you'll be able to um, uh, figure out what's going on now and maybe we can um, uh, take good steps as a society to improve some of these problems. Thanks for listening.